there were. In an early year of this century, two members of the troop of scouts attached to a famous school, named respectively Arthur Wilcox and Stanley Judkins. They were the same age, boarded in the same house, were in the same division, and naturally were members of the same patrol. They were so much alike in appearance as to cause anxiety and trouble, and even irritation to the masters who came in contact with them. But oh, how different were they in their inward man or boy. As a scout, Arthur Wilcox secured every badge and distinction for which he competed. The cookery badge, the map-making badge, the life-saving badge, the badge for picking up bits of newspaper, the badge for not slamming the door when leaving pupil room, and many others. You cannot be surprised to hear that Mr. Hope Jones added a special verse to each of his songs in commendation of Arthur Wilcox, or that the lower master burst into tears when handing him the good conduct medal in its handsome claret-colored case, the medal which had been unanimously voted to him by the whole of the third form. You cannot again wonder that in after years, Arthur Wilcox was the first boy to become captain of both the school and of the opulence, or that the strain of carrying out the duties of both positions, coupled with the ordinary work of the school, was so severe that a complete rest for six months, followed by a voyage round the world, was pronounced an absolute necessity by the family doctor. It would be pleasant task to trace the steps by which he attained the giddy eminence he now occupies. But for the moment, Enough of Arthur Wilcox. Time presses, and we must turn to a very different matter, the career of Stanley Judkins. As a scout, Stanley Judkins secured no badge save those which he was able to abstract from members of other patrols. In the cookery competition, he was detected trying to introduce squibs into the Dutch oven of the next-door competitors. For the tidiness badge, he was disqualified because in the midsummer school time, which chanced to be hot, he could not be dissuaded from sitting with his fingers in the ink, as he said, for coolness sake. For one piece of paper which he picked up, he must have dropped at least six banana skins or orange peels. Aged women, seeing him approaching, would beg him with tears in their eyes not to carry their pails of water across the road. They knew too well what the result would be. In short, Stanley Judkins was no credit to the scouts. And there was talk on more than one occasion of informing him that his services were no longer required. In the end, however, milder counsels prevailed, and it was decided to give him another chance. So it is that we find him camping with the troop at the beginning of the midsummer holidays. It was a lovely morning. Stanley and one or two of his friends, for he still had friends, lay basking on the top of a grassy down, staring at a clump of trees in the middle distance. I wonder what that place is called, said Stanley. Anybody got a map? Here's one, said Wilfred Pipsqueak, ever resourceful. And there's the place marked on it. But it's inside the Red Ring. We're not allowed there. You can ask this old chap what it's called if you're so keen to find out, said Algernon de Montmorency. This old chap was an old shepherd who had come up and was standing behind him. Good morning, young gents, he said. You got a fine day for your doings, ain't you? Yes, thank you, said Algernon with native politeness. Can you tell us what that clump over there is called? And what's that thing inside it? Of course I can tell you, said the shepherd. That's wailing well, that is. But you ain't got no call to worry about that. There ain't a man or a sheep in these parts uses wailing well, nor haven't done all the years I've lived here. Well, there'll be a record broken today, then, said Stanley Judkins, because I shall go and get some water out of it for tea. Sakes alive, young gentleman the shepherd in a startled voice. Don't you get to talking that way. Why ain't your master give you notice not to go by there? Yes, they have, said Wilfred Pipsqueak. Shut up, you ass, said Stanley Judkins. What's the matter with it? Isn't the water good? I don't know as there's anything much wrong with the water, said the shepherd. All I know is my old dog wouldn't go through that field, let alone me or anyone else that's got a morsel of brains in their heads. But I see there's tracks in it, said Wilfred. Someone must go through it sometimes. Tracks, said the shepherd. I believe you. Four tracks, three women and a man. Who are they? asked Algernon. Why do they go there? There's some perhaps could tell you who they was, said the shepherd. But it was afore my time they come by their end. And why they go there still is more than the children of men can tell. Except I've heard they was all bad uns when they was alive. 
Why, you don't mean they're deaders, cried Stanley. What rot! There must be a lot of fools to believe that. Who's ever seen them, I'd like to know? I've seen them, young gentlemen, said the shepherd. About four o'clock of the day it was, much such a day as this. I see them, each one of them, come peering out the bushes and stand up and work their way slow by them tracks towards the trees in the middle where the well is. And what were they like? Do tell us, said Algernon and Wilfred eagerly. Rags and bones, young gentlemen. All four of them fluttering rags and whitey bones. It seemed to me as if I could hear them clacking as they got along. Very slow they went and looking from side to side. The boys pondered for some moments on what they'd heard, after which Wilfred said, And why is it called Wailing Well? If you was round here at dusk of a winter's evening, you wouldn't want to ask why, was all the shepherd said. Early in the afternoon of next day, the following dialogue was heard. Wilcox, is all your tent there? No, sir, Judkins isn't. That boy is the most infernal nuisance ever invented. Where do you suppose he is? Sir, I shouldn't wonder if he'd gone to the Wailing Well. Do you mean inside the Red Ring? Good heavens, what makes you think he's gone there? Why, he was terribly keen to know about it yesterday, and we were talking to a shepherd man, and he told us a lot about it and advised us not to go there. But Judkins didn't believe him and said he meant to go. Young ass said Mr. Hope Jones. Did he take anything with him? Yes, I think he took some rope and a can. We did tell him he'd be a fool to go, little brute. What the deuce does he mean by pinching stores like that? Well, come along, you three, we must go after him. Why can't people keep the simplest orders? It was a wonderful day of shimmering heat. The sea looked like a floor of metal. There was no breath of wind. They were all exhausted when they got to the top and flung themselves down on the hot grass. Below them, the well inside the clump of bent and gnarled scotch firs was plainly visible. And so were the four tracks winding about among the thorns and rough growth. Nothing to be seen of him yet, said Mr. Hope Jones. But we must keep a sharp lookout. I thought I saw the bushes stir down there. Yes, said Wilcox, so did I. Look, no, that can't be him. It's somebody, though, putting their head up, isn't it? I thought it was, but I'm not sure. Silence for a moment. Then, that's him, sure enough, said Wilcox, getting over the hedge on the far side, don't you see? With a shiny thing, that's the can you said he had. Yes, it's him, and he's making straight for the tree, said Wilfred. At this moment, Algernon, who had been staring with all his might, broke into a scream. What's on that track? On all fours? Oh, it's the woman. Oh, don't let me look at her. Don't let it happen. And he rolled over, clutching at the grass and trying to bury his head in it. Stop that, said Mr. Hope Jones loudly, but it was no use. Look here, he said. I must go down there. You stop here, Wilfred, and look after that boy. Wilcox, you run as hard as you can to the camp and get some help. They ran off, both of them. Wilfred was left alone with Algernon and did his best to calm him, but... Indeed, he was not much happier himself. From time to time, he glanced down the hill and into the field. He saw Mr. Hope Jones drawing nearer at a swift pace, and then, to his great surprise, he saw him stop, look up and round about him, and turn quickly off at an angle. What could be the reason? He looked at the field, and there he saw a terrible figure, something in ragged black with whitish patches breaking out of it. The head perched on a long, thin neck, half hidden by a shapeless sort of blackened sunbonnet. The creature was waving thin arms in the direction of the rescuer who was approaching, as if to ward him off. And between the two figures, the air seemed to shake and shimmer as he had never seen it. He looked away hastily to see Stanley Judkins making his way pretty quickly towards the clump and in proper scout fashion picking his steps with care to avoid treading on snapping sticks or being caught by arms of brambles. Evidently, though he saw nothing, he suspected some sort of ambush and was trying to go noiselessly. Wilfred saw all that, and he saw more, too. With a sudden and dreadful sinking of the heart, he caught sight of someone among the trees waiting, and again of someone, another, of the hideous black figures working slowly along the track from another part of the field, looking from side to side, as the shepherd had described it. Worst of all, he saw a fourth, 
unmistakably a man this time, rising out of the bushes a few yards behind the wretched Stanley and painfully, as it seemed, crawling into the track. On all sides, the miserable victim was cut off. Wilfred was at his wit's end. He rushed at Algernon and shook him. Get up, he said. Yell, yell as loud as you can. Oh, if we'd only got a whistle. Algernon pulled himself together. There's one, he said. Wilcox is. He must have dropped it. So one whistled, the other screamed. In the still air, the sound carried. Stanley heard. He stopped. He turned round. And then, indeed, a cry was heard more piercing and dreadful than any that the boys on the hill could raise. It was too late. The crouched figure behind Stanley sprang at him and caught him about the waist. Stanley struck with his can, the only weapon he had. The rim of a broken black hat fell off the creature's head and showed a white skull with stains that might be wisps of hair. By this time, one of the women had reached the pair and was pulling at the rope that was coiled about Stanley's neck. Between them, they overpowered him in a moment. The awful screaming ceased and then the three passed within the circle of the clump of fur. It for a moment. It seemed as if rescue might come. Mr. Hope Jones had scrambled over the hedge and was plunging through the bushes. At the same time, the boys glanced behind them and saw a troop of figures coming over the top of the next down. The rescuers from the camp had arrived. A few hasty words and all were dashing down the hill. They had just entered the field when they met Mr. Hope Jones. Over his shoulder hung the corpse of Stanley Judkins. He'd cut it from the branch to which he found it hanging, waving to and fro. There was not a drop of blood in the body. On the following day, Mr. Hope Jones sallied forth with an axe, and with the expressed intention of cutting down every tree in the clump and of burning every bush in the field. He returned with a nasty cut in his leg and a broken axe helve. Not a spark of fire could he light and on no single tree could he make the least impression. I have heard that the present population of the Wailing Well Field consists of three women, a man, and a boy. Such is the story of the career of Stanley Judkins, and of a portion of the career of Arthur Wilcox. It has, I believe, never been told before. If it has a moral, that moral is, I trust, Obvious. If it has none, I do not well know how to 